I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. I look forward to next year. <laughs> So as Yosi said, um, really one of the, the focus of this is what can we do in the immediate aftermath of trauma? And one of the most um, exciting opportunities in psychiatry, of course, is prevention of psychiatric disorders. And PTSD provides one of the few places where perhaps if we knew the right way to intervene in the immediate aftermath of a trauma, whether it be on the battlefield or in the emergency department or after a mass disaster, we could prevent um, potentially suffering of millions of people um, from ever happening. Um, and so Matthew is going to talk about um, some of the current treatments for PTSD. Unfortunately, in terms of early prevention, we still don't have much that is empirically validated. It's mostly along the lines of support, um, providing um, physical support, water, food, shelter, psychological and emotional support, communication to family members, communication about what's going on, and really, in the, and then as people recover or don't recover over time, providing them appropriate psychiatric and psychological support. The goal of our field and what I'm going to be telling you about is what we hope is the future for how by understanding the biology of early memory trauma consolidation, might we be able to have new treatments and interventions to prevent PTSD from ever happening. So again, post-traumatic stress disorder is often um, historically thought about in terms of, of military, and it was you know, first described by the ancient Greeks and Romans after um, war. Um, but we now know, of course, that it happens in all um, people re related to trauma after um, surviving a near-death or very severely threatening experience, and whether that be fires or floods or, sh or, or um, interpersonal violence, or of course, mass shootings and, and other unfortunate human-related disasters, we can have PTSD. In brief, um, we understand quite a bit now about the circuitry of post-traumatic stress disorder in many ways more than we do many other psychiatric disorders, which also makes PTSD particularly tractable from a scientific and intervention perspective. There are while there are many brain areas involved, those that are most understood relate to the triad, if you will, of the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. The amygdala is really thought of as the fear hub or the threat hub where many emotionally salient responses um, occur, essentially threat re reflexes. That's constantly modulated by prefrontal cortical activity that dampens or suppresses amygdala activation and by hippocampus, which provides the contextual information. All the way back well over 100 years ago, it's Pavlov, we under, have understood about the learning components of, of previously conditioned and unconditioned stimuli being paired. It's now understood that a lot of that Pavlovian conditioning is occurring at a molecular and cellular level, specifically within the amygdala. And for example, in a car accident situation, a, car tra a traffic act, um, crash, one might previously have a conditioned stimulus such as a neutral car or a road um, but after a car crash where there's pain and threat and, near, and, and death related experiences that can act as the unconditioned aversive signal. So that after this event, perhaps one doesn't want to drive or be in a car or be near a car or may jump every time one hears an, a sudden noise. And the thought is that through synaptic plasticity events at the initial trauma encoding, via molecular mechanisms, um, via NMDA, calcium mechanisms, BDNF and other growth factors lead to structural changes in the synapses coming into the amygdala and the projections going out of the amygdala. So that after this, the condition stimulus alone is sufficient to activate a threat or fear response. And work by people like Michael Davis and Mike Fanzalo and Joe Ledoux over many decades showed that hardwired projections from the amygdala to many subcortical areas, such as the hypothalamus, the brainstem regions, and the um, other subcortical areas, lead to the essentially panic th or threat reflex, leading to the increased heart response, the gastrointestinal upset, the hyperarousal, the vigilance, the increased startle, the freezing, and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis cortisol response. So it's one of the few places in our field where we essentially can have a well-known reflex of emotion secondary to this trauma experience. People have looked at and tried to understand the mechanisms of trauma memory consolidation for a long time. A lot of this was led er early on by Jim McGaw and, and Bino Rusendahl and others who really focused on the early consolidation processes via the HPA cortisol axis and adrenergic um, axis where norepinephrine and cortisol come together for memory formation. 
And McGaw um, really worked out that there were several time frames of, of memory consolidation. There were early short-term minute time frames that last from seconds to hours, longer-term time frames from hours to days, and long-lasting from day, months to lifetime. And people such as our own Josie Yosar, Zohar have talked about the idea of a golden hours. Could we intervene in these early short-term memory consolidation periods in a way before the memory is ever really fully instantiated to prevent it from ever becoming permanent or at least detrimental as it does for PTSD? Of course, at a molecular level, Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize for his early work on learning and memory and many of the basic mo molecules and um, processes that he worked out in aplegia sensitization still hold up in mammalian learning and memory. For example, the role of CREB in many of the um, memory systems and synapse related um, molecules are all activated in these early immediate period with growth factors and axon and dendrite plasticity agents. More recently, um, Joe Ledoux and um, work by his group over many years showed that the same processes that we understand physiologically, like long-term potentiation in the projections from the thalamus to the amygdala and the cortex of the amygdala mediate that structural and physiological plasticity underlying trauma memory consolidation. My own work with Michael Davis, when I started in the field, um, began to look at the molecular mechanisms of that memory consolidation. And what was interesting in cortex and amygdala and hippocampus and other places, we saw similar waves of plasticity, just like McGaw had, and, and Candela talked about, short-term changes, medium to long-term changes, and very long-lasting as well as inhibitory changes, which seemed to shape the pro, um, new production of synapses and shape the long-term structural events mediating memory consolidation. So that we now as a field understand a lot about the process of memory, that a traumatic event leads to short-term memories that then are consolidated to long-term memories. Reactivation of those long-term memories brings the memory back into working threat memory that can then be extinguished over time. And most of our current psychotherapies based on exposure are based on this extinction process where we learn a new safety memory that then inhibits these other memories. There's a lot of excitement about the idea of reconsolidation. Can you make a memory labile and then suppress it again and essentially make it erase after it's become permanent? And while exciting, that's been less clear if that can happen in a way that is clinically relevant in humans. But what remains very exciting is the very early process of consolidation. Because there are these minutes to hours, these golden hours, as Zohar says, that one might be able to intervene and prevent that initial memory from ever being formed in the same way. So how do we do this in humans? Our group has been working for about 10 years now in emergency departments. It started with a collaboration with Charlie Nimeroff at Miami when I was still at Emory and where we inter, um, enrolled about 500 people in the aftermath of trauma. And um, in what was exciting about that is we were able to gather blood within the first minutes after they came into the emergency department. And once they were stable, we were able to consent them. And if they did not consent, the blood was discarded. If they did consent, we were able to have this early blood biomarker. We also collected physiological data, wearable data, and brought people back for neuroimaging and physiology and followed them up for a year. And those early um, data from that study then led to a much larger uh, multi-site study led by Sam McLean at North Carolina, Kirsten Conan and Ron Kessler at Harvard Medical School and myself. And this project called the Aurora Project had over 25 emergency departments across America um, with the goal of enrolling over 5,000 patients to really work out the, um, have a large shareable data set for really understanding the full trajectory of physiological, psychological, and neural outcomes in the aftermath of trauma. With, of course, the long-term goal was, can we use these data to both predict who's most at risk in the aftermath of trauma and what are precision psychiatry treatments we can provide for them? And two of the relatively early data sets that have come out of this, you mentioned Isaac Galitzer-Levy, who's friends and colleagues of many of us um, and some of their work. So this first paper by Katharina Schollebrooks and Isaac and team um, was based on that initial Emory data set and then of about 400 people and a secondary validation data set of a couple hundred people from um, New York from Isaac's um, um, medical school. And the take home message is they were able to use machine learning um, and take a whole host of different um, types of data, both self-report data, medical record data, and blood-based data from the emergency room to make predictors of who may predict go on to have PTSD months or up to a year later. 
And what they found in the take home message for this is that with both their training data set, which was the Grady emergency room and the external validation set data set, which was the Bellevue um, emergency room, this overall set of predictors had about a 0.84, 84% chance of predicting who would be likely to develop PTSD. And um, there are several different ways of looking at this, but um, with the Shapley model, they were able to show that the, the, the highest predictor still in some ways is self-report, the, um, the um, stress re reactivity um, checklist, immediate stress reactivity checklist, and some of the specific items within that related to intrusive thoughts and memories and confusion. Um, but very high up there also was neutrophils, lymphocytes, glucose, creatinine, chloride, and other markers that we think are all related to um, sort of immediate stress reactants and immediate inflammatory reactants. So a lot is, needs to be done and this needs to be replicated, but it's an exciting beginning. From the Aurora data set, almost 2,000 people were included in one of the first large um, publications from that um, by Gary Clifford and Kaknock and Ron Kessler and colleagues. And this, this little bit of data that I'm showing here was based on using a wearable device. So this is a wearable watch. It's kind of like a Fitbit, but it's actually a Google watch measuring both actigraphy and um, heart rate variability and heart rate. And just as one example, these are three different ways of measuring heart rate variability, essentially vagal, that's thought to be a proxy for vagal activity. And in all three cases, root mean squared, high frequency, and a, a, another um, measure of um, end to end ratio, all showed that healthy subjects, so again, people who were healthy at six to 12 months, had much higher heart rate variability um, during these early weeks of um, actigraphy measures than did those who have PTSD. And again, um, their area under the curves on this measure was also around 75 to 80%. So the, the time it's are still relatively early in these large data sets and how we can use machine learning, but they're quite promising that we will have ability to stratify patients. What else do we know about the biology in the aftermath of trauma? And I'll show you um, just a few examples here. So this is work from, from Emory early on where we looked at two weeks after the trauma, how did their brain imaging predict whether they had PTSD three months or six months later. And here, um, Jenny Stevens showed that amygdala activation and dorsal anterior cingulate, both of which are um, associated with increased fear response and increased PTSD symptoms in chronic PTSD populations, they were both associated with greater likelihood of PTSD symptoms at three months and 12 months, even though um, the imaging was done only two weeks afterwards. So again, these early brain circuits associated with later PTSD are already hyperactive, if you will. In terms of regulating these hyperactive amygdala circuits, the hippocampus, as we know, is one of the critical components for modulating context and extinction of fear. And Sana Van Roy um, showed that the, that there was an inverse relationship with hippocampal activity. So that low hippocampal activity to a um, stop signal task was associated with much greater PTSD symptoms at both three months and six months versus high hippocampal activity. And finally, in terms of a more um, potentially um, easy to implement in, um, approach, um, Tanya Yovanovitch and um, Becky Heinrich showed that an early measure of galvanic skin response, so again, sympathetic arousal, again, opposite of the, of the, um, of the HRV idea that you know, parasympathetic and sympathetic. I just showed you data earlier from Aurora that parasympathetic activity is lower in PTSD. And what um, Tanya and Becky showed was that using just a simple finger-based galvanic skin response measure, while people are in the emergency room, some of them are still strapped to a board waiting to be cleared just ask them what brought you into the emergency department and that simple question very highly correlated with whether they had ptsd symptoms six months later um, so again this needs to be replicated but it's quite exciting that uh, and it comes back to the early mcgaw and rusendahl and other work that early um, dysregulation of the cortisol system and hyperactivation of the adrenergic sympathetic system may be strong later predictors what do we do in the future how do we use this biology to understand and, and look at interventions? And while there are a lot of different potential pathways that are starting to be looked at related to new treatments for psychotherapy based on our understanding of the biology, um, we, we're not there yet. 
And I just wanted to show you um, one example of how basic neuroscience is starting to look at potentially translatable new ideas for intervening in the aftermath of trauma. So this is a study led by Raul Landero, who um, is now at University of Barcelona and is active in ACMP, and when he was a postdoc in my group. And he was looking at mouse models of fear consolidation. So we took mice, we um, fear conditioned them with a shock, and then we looked at um, their brain changes over time. And in one of the genes that he found that was differentially expressed in the immediate aftermath of trauma was called tachykinin 2 or neurokinin B. And he found that it was expressed in the amygdala immediately after trauma, like one of these early phase genes. Um, and then it came back down to normal. And it, um, it only occurred in, in associative learning with paired tone shock and not unpaired. What was particularly interesting about tachykinin in addition to its expression um, time frame, was its lo location. TAC2 is specifically expressed in the medial, central medial amygdala, the subregion of the amygdala, that is the main output region projecting down to the um, brainstem, down to the locus ceruleus, to the hypothalamus, to these other hardwired output areas. And that leads it to be a particularly interesting set of cells and peptides that may specifically mediate this early trauma reflex. So we asked, could you impair tachykinin activation and impair memory consolidation? And there's a another reason why it was exciting. There's been a drug called Osanotent, which is a pretty specific TAC2 antagonist that's been known now for a couple decades because it was initially looked at in schizophrenia. It wasn't effective there, um, but it's already been shown to be safe in humans. And what um, Raul showed was that if he gave Osanotent systemically to immediately after trauma, fear conditioning, one hour after fear conditioning, or four hours after fear condition, or, or so, so 30 minutes before, 10 minutes after, or one hour afterwards, he saw a decrease in the memory later on. But four hours later, he did not. So it suggested that you had to act in this temporal consolidation window. If he specifically gave it within the amygdala, he saw the same thing. So the systemic effect seems to be happening through the amygdala. You give it in the aftermath of fear conditioning, you test them the next day, 24 hours later, and those animals that had the antagonist show much less fear 24 hours later. We then genetically showed with a, a, a transgenic, um, genetically modified virus that overexpressed tachykinin 2. If you overexpress it in the amygdala, and do fear conditioning. Again, they look the same during the initial fear conditioning, but now when you test them 24 hours later, the animals that overexpress tachykinin 2 show much more fear. And finally, um, he, he did a new experiment combining both of these approaches. And he showed that if in, in, a, in a two by two design with either plus minus overexpression of tachykinin 2 or plus minus the antagonist, if he again overexpressed the tachykinin 2, he, he saw more fear conditioning. If he gave the antagonist in the control animals, GFP, he saw less fear conditioning. And if he did both, he normalized the fear conditioning. So this is one example of how we can think about identifying new pathways and new biology for blocking consolidation. And, and especially if we can repurpose drugs like a sanitant that are already known to be safe, it may be particularly powerful. And just to mention, um, the tachykinin system in the medial amygdala was also shown by um, David Anderson and Moriel Zalowski to be very similarly involved in chronic, with chronic stress isolation and stress-related trauma. So again, multiple convergent lines of evidence that this is an important aversive signaling um, memory modulating protein. So in summary, our field is now one where we're hoping to get to this holy grail of being able to intervene in the immediate aftermath of trauma, these golden hours. And we're starting to have a lot of new biology. Some of the older biology that's still very exciting is some of the great work by um, Zohar and many others on giving hydrocortisone in the early aftermath of trauma, though um, larger studies still need to be done. Um, there's also um, was thought that you could give propranolol, a beta blocker in the aftermath. That has not worked as well clinically, but it's also not clear if it's been given early enough in the aftermath of trauma to really prove the hypothesis. A lot of these things may have to be done in a way that you're giving them in the same, we have to think about this in the same way we think about preventing a heart attack or a stroke. You have these time windows in emergency departments where you really have to act quickly and those kinds of studies will need to be identified. But the biology is also leading to a number of new ideas. I told you about the tachykinin-2 antagonist. Turns out caffeine antagonists, Adora-2A, may also have a very interesting um, role, as well as neurotensin-2 and many others. All of these along the idea of can we block this early memory consolidation for long-term prevention.
So on that, um, I'd just like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm really the cheerleader of a great team, um, and I really look forward to the question and answer and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kerry. That is a, is a, is a beautiful overview, uh, a very, very comprehensive of the, of the state of the art or where we are in this, in this really what you said several times in this golden hour opportunity in the, in the immediate aftermath after traumatic stress exposure. Um, I, I, I made a few notes and I have, I have a, a couple of questions, but, but if, we, um, if we do justice to all the attendees, we'd like to first give the, give the audience um, um, an opportunity to, um, to bring their questions to the table. And what we have done is Irina is sort of the moderator of, of the questions that now, if we open up to the Q&A, can be addressed, uh, addressed to you. Um, Irina, yeah, is, you. is that okay that you will... You will read yeah, yeah, thank you. Our, yes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Professor Ressler, thank you for this uh, great presentation. I can feel that we need more time to go back to the presentation and maybe digest it more slowly. But uh, we've got some uh, questions in advance. And I know that in the audience as well, we have, uh, we have questions from, from our uh, colleagues. Uh, am I right? Do we have questions? But uh, let's start with the question, you know, from from, from the participant, and then yes. we yes, can exactly, yeah, move on, yeah. So maybe you first introduce yourself, your name, and then uh, briefly, because we we'd like to give uh, a, 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 a few people the opportunity to introduce and to um, uh, ask a question. Go ahead, Irina. Who yeah, maybe maybe uh, our uh, uh, Sophia. Yes, I can see that uh, Sophia from Ukraine is ready okay. to ask her question. Please uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sophia. I'm a PhD student uh, from Ukraine, also clinical psychologist, um, and uh, I have a question to Professor uh, Ressler. And um, I'm actually curious about whether uh, it is possible to solve the problem of um, using self-report uh, measures. Rather than, uh, rather than uh, gold standard uh, structured clinical interviews by using uh, artificial intelligence? It's a great question. Thank you, Sophia. Um, and, you know, I think this is where the field has gone back and forth on what, what are gold standards. And I think, I think our gold standards like CAPS are the gold standards for the DSM diagnosis that we created. <laughs> The, the, the issue with our, our current DSM diagnosis or ICD-10 diagnosis is that um, they're human constructs and we know now that they don't really match on the biology all of that well. And so as we think more about um, really what are the true underlying syndromes that we're treating based on biology, they may or may not perfectly match onto, the, and with, onto these constructs. And we think, for example, there are probably 10 or 20 different ways or, or many more, I think. I, one of Isaac's papers said 6,000 or something, <laughs> ways that you can have PTSD. And so um, NIH, for example, in America has moved more to what's called the RDOC, um, Research Domain Criteria, We're really focusing on this transdiagnostic syndromes and symptoms. And in some ways that matches more to what clinicians see. We really focus on all the symptoms and then we try to, we try to fit them into diagnostic clusters. That said, some of the early data I showed um, with machine learning showed that you know, these symptom clusters, the, um, the immediate stress reaction checklist, a very quick self-report checklist was actually quite pre predictive. Um, of some of the later follow-up. So I think we have to keep both of these in mind. And while I think the, the gold standard is important for grounding it to our current nosology and terminology, I think for research and probably for intervention, we're gonna have to be much more open-minded about symptoms, symptom spectrum and checklists. Hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and there is another question. Maybe you can assign the question oh, to the name. Yes, 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 Zoya, please. Yes, yes, thank you very much. My name is Zoya. I am also a colleague of Irina and Sofia, also a PhD student, and I have two questions. One question I just created after question by Sofia. <laughs> so this question is, can we predict some, uh, or by E or machine learning, can we pre uh, create or predict some hard traits that can, uh, can give us some symptoms that, that we can assume that they are PTSD would be something like you know this Apple programs about the stroke 
or something like that. I know it's uh, too unpredictable, but maybe sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so, the, so two of the first data slides I showed after introducing the emergency department were both using machine learning approaches um, with um, data that you can have presumably very quickly in the emergency department, some of the early blood-based data and early self-report data. And those have about an 80% predictive level of who will go on to develop PTSD six or 12 months later. Um, the, the skin conductance data that I showed potentially was even higher in its prediction, um, but again, that's a smaller sample size. So while we don't quite know, um, we don't have the perfect algorithm yet um, by far, um, and then how to best implement that algorithm will be a whole nother problem. Um, it does feel promising that we're starting to be able to get close to prediction enough, you know, whether how much greater than say 90% we'll have, I'm not sure, but that still um, would be pretty powerful if you could say, okay, you have a 90% likelihood of later developing PTSD. We really need to, you know, put you into a treatment program or into a prevention program. Um, and you would still be able to separate the vast majority who you know will not have PTSD from that smaller group that you need to intervene with. Thank you very much. And my uh, second question, I know it's too in advance, but uh, maybe we can predict what uh, type of trauma can create PTSD, you know, specific mm -hmm. type. Right. It's a great question. What type of trauma? And, you know, that's probably one of the, the those things that we've studied as a field longer because we haven't needed as much complex tools to ask that. And I think that, you know, uh, we've got many, you know, other world experts on the call here and they can chime in. <laughs> but my take on that is, um, you know, the, the thing that is held up is interpersonal trauma. Um, if interpersonal violence, um, if it's someone you know or someone close to you, you know, in, in which there's relationships, that's often the highest risk um, versus sort of objective external traumas, um, you know, maybe a car crash where you didn't really see any faces. Um, that said, we don't seem to see a lot of difference biologically so far in the military trauma versus the interpersonal trauma versus the, the car accident trauma. So it probably has something to do with how much that trauma goes against one's internal expectations or violates one's expectations but I think it's not so simple to say, okay, this specific kind of trauma is gonna cause this and this kind of trauma causes this. They all seem to funnel through the same biological mechanisms. Yeah, and I think, I think there is some knowledge that if you experience repeated trauma, mm -hmm. then you are more exposed to this. Right. And there is some suggestion that intentional that uh, if the individual, you know, kind of sense that this is uh, intended toward him, like personal is more prone versus, let's say, um, a earthquake, where it's not something that uh, is intentional. Absolutely. And building on that, I think what I didn't mention at all, but we study a lot in the field studies a lot, is childhood trauma. So certainly child abuse and childhood trauma during development changes the brain in a different way. Um, and so that is almost certainly a different thing, people who have early childhood trauma and then later the trauma compared to those who did not have early childhood trauma. Do okay, I have there, is, mm -hmm. there is there is another question from, from the audience, but from, from the chat, uh, I think from mm. Isa. Yes, okay. uh, do you want Isa, do you want to uh, ask your question by yourself? Isa okay. In Indonesia, we can read it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so the question is like, uh, do we have experience that cases related traumatic memories related to the to the COVID nineteen, such as PTSD, uh, for the first uh, of post COVID? Yes. Um, so I, I don't myself have not studied this, but there are a lot of papers now showing increased rates of post traumatic stress disorder particularly among uh, healthcare workers who've seen a lot of death and been in you know, very um, difficult situations, as well as certainly family members who have been in situations where they felt helpless, but you know, had to watch someone suffer or die. Um, certainly the, the rates of increase in PTSD, other anxiety and depression are multiple fold in the COVID related um, era. So that's a very good question and, important, and unfortunate for what we're going through right now. 